It's really so great to be back here, and thank you, Isabel. Thank you so much for coming. Great to do it. And Millard, um, that was a pleasure. It, it, it's awesome. Uh, there's some pretty cool construction stuff that I thought yeah. you might want to leave. So stay here. So you, you might want to cancel whatever okay. you're supposed uh, to I'll stay as long as I can. Um, <laughs> you'll know that my, my phone sounds like an alarm. Really, so. um, it sounds like a great um, <laughs> so, so just a quick background on me. I, I transferred here to study solar architecture. Um, within my first year, I took a class during the winter called The Politics of Design by Langton Winner. And we read The Power Broker about Robert Moses. And my life changed. And I decided to go to graduate school in city and regional planning. And eventually got a law degree as well. Um, my senior thesis, just to prove my cred with you, that I actually was a, a student, I should say, excuse me, human ecology essay, is that what it's called? Uh, the title of it was Evaluation of Solid Waste Disposal Options for Bar Harbor and Mount Desert Island. We were throwing all our trash in a landfill right next to the high school and was leaching into whatever stream that is next to the high school. And Ed Calver, if you know that name, he was on my senior uh, advising team, and he really helped me. And, when, um, and we actually started up the recycling program for the town of Bar Harbor. One had not existed before, and it turned out to be the first one in the state. And if anything I'm about to share with you and talk to you about, I swear my most uh, precious thing I've ever done with my career was uh, uh, the summer of after my graduation from here, before I started grad school, when I started up that that recycling program. I work. I took. I never take a vacation, but I took three or four vacation days oh in the Glen. All it was was tractor trailer trailers themselves. Right. And we. Had, my God, it was so hot. I remember how hot it was inside us, and we just packed cardboard and newspaper. <laughs> and, 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 and what was amazing about that is that you know I made it. I put ads in the local paper. The bar, Barber Times still exists. Uh, no, uh, no, uh, no. Uh, you know, put local ads in, got some publicity, and then people's behavior changed. That's amazing. That was the first time I learned that you know um, you know you could ask people to do something different, and many of them will. And all these people kept dropping off all this carpet, and our job was to take the boxes down and, 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 and stack everything. Um, I then went to uh, Kennedy School of Government at Harvard from here and got a, a master's in public administration. I met a guy who introduced me to a, a lady who introduced me to a guy who was the father of the big dig. His name was Fred Salvucci. And I was working in the state house for Mike Dukakis, Governor Dukakis, if that name rings a bell for anybody. He ran for president once, didn't do quite well. <laughs> um, uh, but a wonderful man. And I worked for his secretary of transportation, his cabinet member. Uh, and he said, come work for me. Uh, we're doing this new thing called the Big Dig. I think you'd be really helpful. And I said, well, you know, I don't really know that I want, want to do transportation for the rest of my life. Energy has always been an interest of mine. I said, how long do you think this will take? I wish I had this <laughs> I wish I had this recorded. I swear, he said, uh, uh, it would take so it would take about four or five years. Um, I was there for 21 years, uh, literally. Never ever thought I would be in the same job for that long. Um, Miller certainly knows how that feels. Um, <laughs> um, that, yeah. uh, but you know, it, it, it was just so exciting because it was such an interdisciplinary job. Uh, it was like the epitome of like, what's a human ecologist doing building a highway? Well, I never really saw it as building a highway. I saw it as trying to change the environment of Boston and use it, it for the better. Um, and, and, and hopefully set an example of what other urban areas should do around the country which is to um, undo a lot of the damage we did by building all these urban expressways and destroying um, uh, downtown. One last bit of history is when I left the Big Dig, I decided I was going to do renewable energy development and consulting, my lifelong passion, and do wind power and solar. Uh, I even hired one of Isabel's uh, recent uh, students uh, to help work with us. 
and I'll save that for another presentation. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, I thought I'd begin, you know, I, I'm a big believer in history, we're going to be talking about roads and bridges and tunnels and stuff. Um, does anyone know where the first road was? I mean, the, the big paths, they'd be muddy and, you know, but where was the first road where they actually laid down a surface that could handle all kinds of weather and, and uh, stuff? It is Rome, exactly. Very good. Um, uh, did you see that on here? Or? <laughs> she does a lot of reading. <laughs> uh, uh, the Appian Way. Uh, the Appian Way. Mm -hmm. uh, it was called. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This That's is great. Wow. Well, I better wake up. Uh, uh, via Arpia Antica, the Appian Way, and um, uh, you know, as part of the design of that road. Um, they were going through the debate of should it all be a grade? Do we need bridges? What, you know, and I'm sure they were talking about the aesthetics. And, and in fact, they did a combination where there'd be the road, and then a portion of it would, you know, have some some elevated. Um, I don't think they had tunnel discussion back then, but um, you know, quite you know, some of us might say quite elegant, very aesthetically pleasing uh, roadway design. Um, this was 300 BC that they were having this discussion. Um, there's the route of the Appian Way. Most of it still exists. It's a historic uh, landmark in Italy. Um, uh, what a wonderful mm -hmm. class trip that would be that I would love to go on as an alumni to the Appian Way. Uh, why don't we fast forward a little bit? Uh, uh, lower Manhattan. Um, uh, that star, the green star, uh, happens to be where Jane Jacobs' house was, where she wrote uh, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. Did most of you read that? That was a trick question. Um, uh, and I know you can't really see the details, but uh, all the thick red lines, um, like here and here and here, crossing these crossings of, 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 of the... Um, of the Hudson and, and East River, um, those are all train tunnels or train bridges. Um, none of them are for automobiles. This is 1916. Lots of people are buying automobiles in 1916. The only two you could cross are the Williamsburg and the Brooklyn Bridge, which were built for mass transit purposes and pedestrian purposes, but they also had tracks on them uh, for, um, excuse me, the tracks for subways. But you could also drive a car over them. Uh, you fast forward just a decade or so, and um, you know uh, I don't know about you, but um, uh, you know to me the next cool thing in life is what's Apple about to sell. Um, but in the twenties, in at least the United States, the next cool thing was what is General Motors going to sell? It was cars. It was Futurama. Uh, uh, there was this gentleman, Norman Belgetes. Um, in the 20s and 30s, a disciple of Le Corbusier. It was up to them. The cities that we all have that you all see today would look so different. They would be full of elevated highways and very little old buildings. Um, but the notion is that, that the image in the 20s and 30s was that the car was, was an example of the United States being an innovator in the world. Um, uh, it, it wasn't something that destroys our lives, our cities. It was something that was going to lead us into the future. Um, talking about that future, uh, first elevated highway, West Side Highway, down uh, uh, west side of New York. Um, there used to be buildings that all this old, beautiful, old historic structures uh, used to come up to the waterfront, all got destroyed. Uh, to build this highway and the ramps and other stuff. Um, uh, this was just to the west of Jane Jacobs' house. She hadn't yet moved in, um, but she certainly knew it was there. Um, one of the first examples of massive land clearing uh, in urban areas in order to build highways. Um, uh, this is another view of the West Side Highway under construction. I always think these things look a little bit more real the closer you get to them. And um, this is in the meatpacking district uh, of New York, very dense packed buildings. 
Um, and what we wanted to do, not me, but what society wanted to do at the time was we needed freeways. We needed to get the Futurama car off the ground, off the congestion, um, and, and, and make our cities livable. Well, it's 1938. This is coming over the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, and um, you know, uh, trains are starting to get displaced by buses um, built by General Motors, but that's a separate story. Um, but there's already congestion coming in that. Head. And um, whatever you think about Robert Moses and what he was trying to do, he was trying to solve, in quotes, a real problem that they had which were people who were moving out of the city into the suburbs, they wanted to commute back to the city. Transit didn't work for everybody. And already, um, you're experiencing some serious congestion. Um, opening up new pieces of highway infrastructure in an urban area, um, these were big things. Uh, this was actually a photo uh, of the opening of the George Washington Bridge which uh, you know, crosses from New Jersey to Manhattan. Most of us think of it, I don't know about you, but when I drive across that thing, I pray. <laughs> I pray that, I'm gonna, that nothing bad's about to happen, and I get on that Cross Bronx Expressway, uh, one of the worst pieces of, of anything humans have done, I think, in our history, and I'm just praying all the time that nothing goes wrong, and 20 minutes later I'll be uh, in a better place. But, Opening up bridges and stuff back then was a huge deal. And so, you know, you come to this, to this lady who, and her husband bought that three-story red building that's on the right of this photo. Um, uh, do you know who that lady was? And do you know what street she happened to live on? It's a minor issue, but you, can, you walk there, it's, it's pretty interesting. They got a sign, Jane Jacobs Way, on the corner. It's 555 Hudson Street between 10th and 11th. Um, uh, uh, the last time I read Jane Jacobs and the Death and Life of Great American Cities was uh, in the library here at whatever the old building was before it burnt down. Kelber Hall. Kelber Hall. Um, it was still called Kelber Hall. Uh, and so it's been a thrill for me to kind of go back and, and, and revisit this. Um, and we'll get a, a lot more into Jane as we go along. Um, but you had, you know, these planners, and Moses is just sort of like the name for really uh, all the professionals, all the best minds, all the greatest graduates, landscape architects, urban planners, city planners. And, you know, so they had these plans in the 30s and 40s, and, you know, there's Jane Jacobs' house again, and uh, the West Side Highway's been built, um, most of the other stuff in the suburbs have been built because, we, uh, I apologize to call Queens in Brooklyn suburbs, but outside of the downtown dense core, those are relatively easy to build. You only have to move 5,000 people out of the way and displace <laughs> them from their homes. But you want to do stuff like the Midtown Manhattan Expressway or the Lower uh, Manhattan Expressway, which is what Jacobs really got famous for, for stopping. Um, and now, you know, the scale of devastation and destruction in the city is up fivefold, tenfold. And, um, uh, and, and, and that's the sort of context that Jacobs is living in uh, when she thinks about the things in, in writing, um, writing a book. And, you know, so uh, again, her house is just off here to the left. This is the West Side Highway. And I don't know what you think, but. You know, maybe this doesn't look so bad, this nice little caricature for Moses and his team of building the Lower Manhattan Expressway. And, oh, well, we need these big ramps that kind of circle. Oh, well, there's six old buildings there. We'll get rid of those. And, and, and you know, it turns out there's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of businesses and homes, if not thousands. And then, oh, by the way, it continues this way to go over to that bridge. But for various reasons, that one was going to be... Uh, uh, not underground, but cut in a, in a ravine, as opposed to be elevated. Um, uh, uh, but this is where Moses made a big mistake, which was not only was he taking on the, the, the regular person who lived in their neighborhood and loved their neighborhood, but this proposal went through the heart of the financial district in Wall Street in New York. And um, 
I'm not saying that they're any more important than the people who live in their homes, but the wealthy finance people in New York teamed up with the people uh, and they stopped Moses. This is the first time he got stopped. Uh, and, um, uh, and um, you know, when you actually color in and you see, you start to get the sense of the scale of the devastation that this project would have um, endured, uh, it's quite phenomenal. Uh, and so here she is. What you know? What a wonderful, um, what a wonderful person. You know, she. So she leads this. She, many things. It's, you can't label Jane Jacobs one thing, but I'm just going to refer to her as an anti-highway activist. Um, and here she was fighting that Lower Manhattan Expressway uh, that I just showed you a photo. Um, but what's amazing is how quickly what she was doing in New York spread to Boston, where I've lived the last 30 years. And so um, I gave you a, 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 a printout. Hopefully some of you got it. Uh, and this is the cover of it. Um, does anyone have a sense of what the red and the, and the, and the black kind of mean? Uh, anyone want to take a guess? all the federal highways that had already been built, and then the black was supposed to be a, a new connector. That's what I remember reading. It's very close, very close. Um, so the red are things out in the suburbs, analogous to the plan we just looked at in New York, the kinds of stuff that was easy to build. Uh, and that's what existed. It all kind of ra radial, uh, radi radiated, radiated, thank you, uh, to downtown Boston. But wow, we got to connect them all. We need something, and we need the central artery. And that's what the black is. This is 1941. I don't know how much any of you dove deeply into that document I gave you, but um, uh, I'll read some quotes from it in a minute. Because uh, it's happening exactly at the same time, you know, uh, it's early 40s. Uh, Jane Jacobs is really doing her thing to stop highways in the urban areas. The same thing is starting to happen in Boston, but n I shouldn't have said that. Not yet it's happening in Boston. In Boston, the public government officials are still saying highways are the greatest thing since sliced bread, particularly highways that we invite and bring right into the downtown of our city. Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, within 10 years of first proposing it here in Boston, uh, this is sort of what Lower Manhattan would have looked like if Jane Jacobs, Jane Jacobs lost. But here in Boston, uh, here we go. Um, uh, Charles River and Boston Garden are up here. Uh, all these old, uh, this is the North End that Jane Jacobs writes so much about in her book. Um, these buildings here and whatnot just all continue to cross. Uh, this was not a case where there was an old railroad alignment where they built the highway in it. That happens quite frequently. No, they just literally took all of this and said, let's start building a highway and here's the first pieces. And construction began in 1951. A thousand buildings were demolished. 20,000 residents were kicked out of their homes um, and told you have to move somewhere else um, to build this section of highway. And the amount of land that it took up in the downtown urban area is just absolutely phenomenal. And then here's that same view. More of the elevated highway has been built. Uh, steel structure, put the concrete deck on, got some ramps and stuff. Uh, and sort of here's that same view where we kind of stopped. It, turned, it turns out that many of these big highway projects get built and get designed and built in phases because they're so complicated. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, but this was the first phase in Boston. And um, that, that uh, other document where we were looking at the color cover, um, I just want to read for you a few quotes. Uh, and, and I'm sure you all memorized them on your own, but I just want to read them <laughs> for you. Uh, uh, civilized society has always required, and in the future will always require, population centers. I guess most of us would probably agree with that. It uh, turns out we weren't thinking about global warming and, and, and emissions and sustainability back in the 40s. But urban areas turn out to be among the most energy efficient um, uh, sustainable uh, modes of, of human life and addition to all the culture and everything else. Another quote um, from that is, motor vehicles are the primary force of life itself. 
This is an actual government document published by the city of Boston in 1941. If you look at the back cover on the bottom, it says printed by the city of Boston, something like that. Otherwise, there's no other reference in that whole document as to who wrote it, who designed it. Um, uh, for a people to prosper, it is necessary to make more wheels, I think they mean automobile wheels, turn faster and to cut down on stopping and starting. I mean, this is what they wrote, to, to, you know, they got, they got, they got $110 million, which back in 1940 was a lot of money, to build this thing, and they actually started. They, they, they move all these people out of the way, and they start building this thing. And here's that same view. Uh, this is that same house right here we were looking before. And now the thing, you know, we're almost in the mid-50s, and now the first phase and the second phase of elevated highway um, are almost ready to be done. In fact, the first phase is already open and you can see cars coming down this ramp here. But the second phase isn't finished. Um, and even if it was, it couldn't carry cars because something had already been changing here in Boston in the mid-50s before the highway even opened. Which is that the new governor named this new guy named John Volpe to be the head of his transportation at the state level. And Volpe's office just happened to be in a building overlooking um, this section of the elevated being built in phase two. And he thought it was the ugliest thing he had ever seen in a downtown urban area. 40 feet high, 200 feet wide, painted a dull green, cutting off Boston from its historic waterfront and harbor. All the things that Jane Jacobs would have done. <coughs> uh, and this guy is now a new senior government officials in Massachusetts. Uh, so part of what I wanted to help explain to you today is, for the cynics of us who think there's no chance to make any change in society, you can. This guy took office. This thing's already being built. Three quarters of it's almost done. And he's like, man, I don't want to have anything to do with this. Uh, and and, and um, there's a famous old building in Boston called the Grain Exchange Building. And I'm just going to point out these uh, crowns and this cone. And Isabel and other architect types will be able to describe this better than I can. But I'm going to show you this crown uh, in a couple of slides. But it won't be as visible in those other slides. I just want to point out to you. And here's phase two coming through. Clearly still an elevated highway. The structure is all there. The, excuse me, the skeleton is all there. And then they're getting ready um, to put the, the rest of the roadway deck on. You knew the aquarium was just off here. There's a little piece of Boston Harbor. Uh, so this Volpe guy uh, looks out of his window and says, you know, even though 1.5 miles of elevator have already been built, uh, I'm calling a halt to the construction. Uh, and I don't think Jane Jacobs, you know, was you know, so successful by then in, in New York. But her work, and her book hasn't been published yet, right? It's still seven years away. Uh, but here we are in Boston. We take the lead in building a, an unfortunate lead in kicking thousands of people out of their homes, building elevated highways, the very things they're still fighting about in New York. And here this guy in charge, this new guy in charge says, well, you know, I, I, I think we've had enough. So he does a radical change for phase three of the project just within two or three years. And, and that elevated stuff I just showed you is in this picture going that way to the north. We're looking north. But what's going on here? We're starting to, we're starting to dig out earth. You don't really dig out earth for an elevated highway. And that's because he changed the design as the project went south through a famous neighborhood in Boston called Chinatown. Uh, and he said, I want it to be a tunnel. I don't want it to be up in the air. And so they start building this tunnel that the elevated highway up here is going to connect down into this tunnel. It's called the South Station Dewey Square Tunnel. And here it is, almost finished in 1957. At that time, it was the widest motor vehicle tunnel in the world, nearly a half a mile long. And so what you had is a major highway through the heart of a downtown core Two-thirds of it's elevated, one-third of it's in a tunnel. And this tunnel served as an inspiration for everyone who lived in Boston for the next 30 years. 
It is really sort of the beginning of the Big Dig itself. Uh, and in fact, the Big Dig saved this tunnel because it was so hard for us to build any of our tunnels. Why, why would we get rid of one that already existed? <laughs> and in fact, this tunnel, which used to operate southbound in this direction and northbound in this direction, the Big Dig changed it to be both sides of it now run southbound. And we built a new tunnel northbound, um, just, uh, just a little bit away from us. But anyway, just a short time later, the elevated opens. I couldn't find any old photos of the elevated going down into that tunnel, but it's sort of in scale, just sort of down right here um, at the top of this chair. Uh, designed for 75,000 vehicles a day. It first opens up. It's relatively empty. Um, it's the highway in the sky. Futurama is here in Boston. Um, uh, all right, we moved, you know, many thousands of people out of the way. Uh, didn't quite yet realize how much it was cutting off this side of Boston from the waterfront side of Boston. But anyway, it was brand spanking new. It was relatively empty. For the people who used it, they loved it. They got in a lot quicker than they would have under the old mode. What was the old mode of getting into an urban city if you happen to live, you know, five or ten miles out of the way. How old are we talking about? In the, in the mid-fifties. Yeah, yeah service, not, not service, service streets, boulevards, if they existed. Commuter rail was the way to go. Okay. Mass transit is another way to say it. Mm -hmm. um, within ten years of opening this highway, half the commuter rail systems in Boston shut down due to lack of ridership. Talk about unsustainability. Talk about anti-environmentalism. We open up this highway, it connects north and south. I'm going to talk about other highways in a second. But this one opened, everyone thought it was just, you know, phenomenal. But Jane Jacobs is still down in New York. And she's, you know, really ratcheting it up and really taking on Moses and, and, and is about to be victorious. And she's almost about to write her book. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, this is from one of uh, uh, Jacob's uh, uh, um, anti-highway things. I highlighted just the two things that people, Jane Jacobs disrupts. I'm not really sure what that word is. Uh, Jane Jacobs speaks for us. Uh, you know, the people were, you know, uh, you know we, we think about the Arab Spring or the whatever else that you all may think about, about where people are stopping government from doing things. Back here in the, in the late 50s, 60s, it's people stopping government from destroying or at least changing the face of our cities uh, in ways that the people think will just be horrible. And you got graffiti, you know, spray painted on buildings, save, uh, where did that, what did that have been, Greenwich Village, East Village. Um, um, uh, quite interesting, in Boston, you got the same graffiti being put on buildings. Uh, stop I-95, people before highways. You know, same, you know, and, and there was no, I, I, you may not have any concept of this, there's no internet, there's no cell phones. It's not really easy to, like, what's happening in New York isn't Twittered up to the people in Boston instantaneously. It's just amazing that these things are happening simultaneously in New York and Boston and, and many other cities as well. But you see that I-95, Interstate 95, let's, let's talk about that. Um, uh, here's another, uh, apologies, we'll talk about that in a second. You know, some posters warning the Southeast Expressway is dangerous to our health. Uh, so there's these grand plans in Boston. And I wanted to show you a little bit about it. So the green arrow is pointing to that black line on the cover we were talking about, the central artery right here. Um, here's the Charles River, here's Cambridge, here's downtown Boston, Logan Airport's over here. Um, um, and this grand plan called for building everything in red, this white that you see, I guess this was in the winter and it snowed, that already exists, it's known as Route 120, it used to be called Route 128 in Boston, it's now 95, and 93 going around Boston. But then this grand plan to bring all these other radios, I mean, it's, it's as if Moses was hired to be the consultant, which he wasn't, to come in. Uh, and um, that highway that I just highlighted in yellow got stopped. And those inner highways right in the middle of downtown Boston and Cambridge got stopped. 
And then this other one leading out to 128 got stopped. And how did they get stopped? And that one got stopped too. So what I want to show you is this red called the Mass Turnpike got built. This red, the Southeast Expressway got built. And this 93 going up to 128 in Maine got built. But these other things that was supposed to, if you will, act as a relief valve for this little section here in green never got built. And that set the stage for why downtown Boston's old elevated central artery um, couldn't handle what it needed to and was also part of why we needed to do something like the Big Dig. So it's sort of like environmentalists and community activists got what they wanted by stopping these highways, but it then led for 20 or 30 years of further problems. So we're just going to kind of zoom in on those other highways that didn't get built uh, in downtown Boston and zoom in a little bit more. And this was a famous one. This was the I-95 where we saw the graffiti coming in through the heart of the South End in Roxbury. And then this was going to be an inner ring going um, through the South End, through Boston University, through Northeastern University, crossing the Charles River at BU, going through Cambridgeport and Cambridge and literally taking part of MIT's campus. And these plans were all drawn up. I've got like, I actually have the original documents someone gave me. This wasn't sort of like just a sketch on a napkin. Like this was really going to happen. Um, but now Jane Jacobs has published her book. And now people are reading it and even more people are getting involved up in Boston. And here's like one of those sketches um, you know, interchange of Porter Square. If anyone's been in Cambridge or Porter Square, it's like the heart of Cambridge. Well, this, what you see here, existed all the way across, but these nice highway people had a way of hiring these nice sketch artists. And they're kind of, you know, kind of, it's like you're floating in the sky. Oh, everything's so nice. And, and, but this is what they did, and, and they spent lots of money doing it. And, 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 and a lot of people, you know, really were opposed, but some people were like, well, I don't know, maybe this won't be so bad, because it didn't look so bad. But then you start taking actual photos of the neighborhood, uh, and this is in Brookline, Massachusetts, Interbelt Expressway, uh, and you start overlaying those same things we were overlaying before on Moses' old plane in Lower Manhattan, and it becomes more real when you start to see the actual buildings that we're going to get demolished. So, um, so uh, uh, it's the late 60s, early 70s. Jane Jacobs is going gangbusters. Or, or I don't know how many copies of her book she sold, but everyone's reading it. Uh, uh, she's about to be successful stopping all those elevateds cutting through Manhattan. But we have this plan in Boston with all these elevateds coming through the downtown as well. And a guy just becomes elected new governor, this guy standing right here. His name was Francis Sargent, uh, and his first week in office, the anti-highway people set up a protest on the State House steps. The State House of Boston's right behind here, and he's greeted by all these people who were telling him, "You got to stop all these highways." And um, uh, and I just thought it would be fun, if you don't mind, just to play a few little audio clips, uh, because the world's about to change. Uh, 180 degrees within six months in the early 70s in Boston. And then what happened in Boston then spread to other cities that also had their highway stop. Many of them unfortunately had a couple built before then. Um, and um, just a couple quick uh, video clips, uh, I mean audio clips, and they're not quick, I apologize. Uh, uh, you may fall asleep as we go along. Steakhouse. Check it out on the website. Before the break, we asked the question, what governor of Massachusetts called for a moratorium on building highways in Boston? And here, with the answer, is Radio Boston's Magna Chakra Party. Well? Well, David, drum roll, please. The answer, <laughs> the answer is Frank Sargent. Okay. Set the tone. All right. So it was the late 60s, early 70s. And at that time, massive highway expansion was going on throughout the country. I mean, the interstate highway system had begun and kicked off in the 1950s, and many, many more people were driving. 
And I remember 95, it was slated to go straight north from Canton through Boston. Yes, and there were plans to expand 95, construct an inner beltway, much like 128, but this one through Cambridge and Brookline, an eight-lane elevated expressways into the city. I mean, think Los Angeles or Chicago. All that was stopped by one man, then Governor Francis W. Sargent, and it really was an extraordinary moment. And you spoke with some of the people who were involved. And so, um, um, I, I don't know, uh, uh, do you like have any issues, public policy issues you all think about and you think about like what government official is going to stand up and give a speech and say exactly what I, you know, you know, is Obama really going to get up and stop Keystone and what's that, that pipeline and what's the speech he's going to give or... You know, who's going to get up at, at uh, some conference uh, on international climate change and give the speech I really want to hear? Well, imagine you're an anti-highway activist, and you're hoping that some government official is going to give a speech that says, we've got to stop doing what we've been doing. Um, and, and there's a famous mural in Cambridge, Massachusetts, painted on the side of a building, a guy with the bulldozer and the people are like, no, stop you, you know. And, and what's amazing is this mural is still here. It keeps getting repainted. It's on the side of uh, Trader Joe's. Uh, for those of is you it, who... Is it, it's micro center. That's right. Yeah, micro That's right. Uh, no, Trader it's Joe's right there. So. No, no, this is Sorry, great. Just, no, uh, bring it on, bring it on. No, that's great. <laughs> Good for you. Um, are you from the area? Or? Yeah, I grew up in Belmont. Okay. Uh, I, I correct myself, it's on the side of the building next to Trader Joe's. Um, but I wanted to play for you, uh, I dug out for you guys, this Governor Sargent's speech. And if you don't mind, I'm going to play for you a long excerpt from it. And please try to listen to it carefully. And imagine if you uh, could have uh, done any better if it was yourself writing the speech. Special report highways or mass transit, the governor decides. From the studios of WCVB-TV, here is the governor of the Commonwealth, Francis W. Sargent. I present to you tonight decisions touching the lives of all of us. I will ask that you share the risks. I'll show you the opportunities. The problems of transportation have held us prisoner for 40 years. And recently, that captivity has become intolerable. You, your family, your neighbors have become caught in a system that's fouled our air, ravaged our cities, choked our economy, and frustrated every single one of us. To move ourselves, our goods, and our services, we've built more and more and bigger and better superhighways and expressways. They seem the easiest, the most obvious answer to our multiplying needs. What we misunderstood was what those highways would create, massive traffic congestion. We found that we had defeated our own purpose and that we had been caught in a vicious cycle. More cars meant more highways, which meant more traffic jams. More traffic jams meant the need for more highways, which meant more traffic jams and the need for superhighways. The result today, miles and miles of bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic creeping along hopelessly crowded highways. The side effect, billions of dollars spent, and more and more cities torn apart, more and more families uprooted and displaced. Worst of all, failure to solve the problem that started it all. How best to get from one place to another? Massachusetts, indeed America, confronts the same old problem, now complicated by a growing paralysis on our superhighways. The old system has imprisoned us. We've become the slaves and not the master of the method we chose to meet our needs. How do we break loose from a system that doesn't work? Two years ago, we faced a similar problem. Then the system we sought to escape was the old and costly method of auto insurance. We found a way out, no fault insurance, a bold but a risky step, imaginative but hazardous. 
we took the risk because the greater risk was to stand still caught in an old system and that gamble paid off so it is today and so today i propose another bold and imaginative step we are fortunate to have the chance to go a new way many states cannot so close are they to completion of an interstate highway system tearing through their densely populated urban areas we had the sense nearly three years ago to pause to review and to take another look at where we were going in massachusetts in february of 1970 i spoke to you on television to declare that it was becoming clear superhighways and some of our old transit plans were not doing the job i called a halt to most of the highway construction within the route 128 area i called a halt to transit's expansion plans developed many years ago. I called for a complete review and then for the development of plans suitable to the space age we've entered. Plans providing a balance of transportation for the years ahead. The study we undertook, a balanced transportation planning review, was the first such in America and became the most comprehensive the nation has yet seen embracing the Southwest Expressway corridor, part of the Massachusetts North Shore, and the economic life of the capital city of Boston. It's 33 months since that study began. The facts are in, the analysis has been made, the decisions before us are now before us for resolution. Tonight, I announce those decisions, and tonight I show the way to a different direction, a bold new way of solving some of our oldest problems. Shall we build more expressways through cities? Shall we forge new chains to shackle us to the mistakes of the past? No. We will not repeat history. We shall learn from it. We will not build the expressways. Instead, we will embark on a nearly $2 billion program blending the best interest of our state, not merely in transportation, but in our economy, and more important in the quality of our lives from now to beyond the start of a new century. Instead of a Southwest Expressway, forever ruining the cherished foul meadow area and further ravaging an already devastated section of a city, we shall build a transit and commuter rail system that will move people faster than rubber tire vehicles can move them. Instead of an interstate highway system on the North Shore, we will improve the existing commuter rail and transit system there and build a feeder road in Revere to improve access to that system. Instead of choking the economy of Boston with more and more traffic congestion, instead of snarling goods entering and leaving the city in motor vehicle traffic, we will improve the value of one of our most important assets, Logan Airport. Not by building a huge cavern for cars, but by building a two-lane, special-purpose new tunnel to Logan. Toll-free to trucks, emergency vehicles, buses, and limousines that speed air travelers to and from parking terminals on the outskirts of Greater Boston. There are important footnotes to these decisions. While we aid the Massachusetts Port Authority by improving access with the construction of a special new tunnel, we must remind the port that it does not live in splendid isolation above the interests of the rest of the community. Logan's advantages must blend with the needs of its neighbors. The state has already acquired three quarters of the South Corridor land, Southwest Corridor land. Today, that cleared land is a wasteland. Tomorrow, it must become a valuable resource for economic, industrial, and community development, for parkland, for a better life for our people. 400 families and 800 jobs will not be disrupted by highway construction. That is the nucleus around which we must work with the city of Boston 
in a cooperative effort of mutual benefit. Though we reject expressways, the North Shore must have a decent highway system for all local trips and commercial vehicles. And for that reason, and to improve highway safety, we will make major improvements to Route 1, planned with local assistance. Because let there be no doubt, while we have set a course of halting expressways in urban centers, we have not halted highway building that makes sense. We will invest over $400 million in local street improvements, in parking for transit, and in stimulating highway building outside the metropolitan area. For, of course, we must have combined transit and highway investment, planned together, working together. But I've only told half the story. The other half is the story of the transit system of the future and the commitment that we must make to that system. So I'll stop, I'll stop right there. Just um, uh, For anyone who knows Boston, uh, there's a red line subway. It used to go to Harvard Square, but in your lifetimes it always went north of Harvard Square and went all the way up to Airwife. Um, uh, when this guy, Governor Sargent, announced stopping building highways, the money to build those highways had already been allocated by Congress. And when he just talked about, well, in the Southwest Corridor, we had already moved people out of the way, that's because they used some of that money and they literally bought people's homes and kicked them out of the way. Uh, and that became the Southwest Corridor, which is now a, a new uh, subway line combined with Amtrak tracks down to New York City. Um, but what Boston did was the first time in the United States history, which um, it said, you know, you, if you've given us a billion dollars to build these highways and we decided we don't want to build most of them, um, uh, you should still let us keep the money, but let us use it on other forms of transportation like, like uh, subways uh, and commuter rail and other mass transit. And you were not allowed to do that until Boston, we had this little guy named Tip O'Neill who represented Cambridge, he happened to be Speaker of the House. He happened to get that through Congress, and so for the first time in the early 70s, as a result of what I've just showed you, um, Boston was allowed by the federal government to shift its highway money to build transit. Um, and uh, 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 it, it, it fast forward to today's world, we call it intermodal transportation planning. Uh, it's, not, it's, not about, it's not about cars, it's about how do we move people and goods, uh, and, and, and that's a result of this. If I let him continue to talk, the governor um, actually uttered the words, and we will look at depressing the central artery, which was the first time that was ever publicly um, uh, uttered. And so, um, you know, you get past his speech, and he stops building all these inner highways that I showed you, which I think was the right thing, don't get me wrong, but what I want to do is show you how the math added up, which is uh, uh, you had built this, this central artery, which was elevated from here to here and then a tunnel from here to here, but you had six lanes coming in on the pike, eight lanes coming in on the Southeast Expressway, four lanes coming in the Sumner Tunnel, six lanes coming in, uh, on the Tobin Bridge, and eight lanes coming, and when I say in, I mean in and out, I apologize, uh, in both directions in 93, and I added it all up, and it was 38 lanes of traffic feeding into what was a three lane in each direction, or six lane central artery, that had been designed in the 40s, built in the 50s, uh, and was never ever contemplated to handle um, what was coming to it. So it's sort of like on the one hand, environmentalists, of which I, I hope we all are, you know, we got what we wanted, which was we stopped destroying our urban cities uh, by building these highways because the cure was worse than the disease. But then we're left with this situation where um, uh, I, I guess none of you personally ever saw this, um, but when I first moved, I left here and moved to Boston in 19, uh, was that? 
I should know, 1982, uh, uh, this is what it looked like eight hours a day up on the elevated central artery. Because uh, if, if you want to go more south, you ended up here. Um, let me go back. Um, so if you, this is north south, north is pointing up. If you want to go north south, you ended up on this green, in this red elevated central artery. But Logan Airport's over here. So if you're coming from the south or the west, or from the west from Cambridge and stuff, and you want to go to Logan Airport, you've got to get on the same elevated central artery to cross the harbor to get over the airport. Um, and, 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 uh, and this is what we have. Um, and uh, so the big dig uh, 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 starts right here where we decided we're no longer going to build any more highways, but yet we've got this thing that's there uh, really uh, not planned uh, to serve what it's serving. Uh, and the big dig, uh, my first, uh, I graduated graduate school in 82, I'm sorry, 84, but my summer internship was working on the original conceptual plan for the big dig. Um, um, because of that lady who knew the guy who I met in, in graduate school. Uh, and so this is that central artery, um, and the mass pipe comes in here and dead ends at the central artery. The big dig was all about doing two things, extending the mass pipe and getting the Logan Airport this way. So this is the extension of the pipe over to Logan Airport, which the first thing it does is take half the traffic off of the central artery they don't need to be there. And then the other thing it does, it says, let's take that mostly elevated thing and find a way to put it underground. And that's what um, the big dig uh, was all about. And uh, it literally was under design from 1983 to 91. I want to give you a sense of how long these things take. I want to give you a sense that um, as a result of us environmentalists and environmental regulations and environmental uh, review procedures, it takes a really long time to think and get approval and, and all kinds of crazy stuff happens, mostly good, uh, some not so good. Um, uh, happy to talk to you about that in Q&A. Um, you may not personally know of the Apollo program, some of us in the room do, um, but while I was working at the Big Dig, I realized that the Big Dig was the modern equivalent of the Apollo program because when they sent the men to the moon, the capsule that the men were in when they, the Apollo 13 capsule from the movie, if that makes any sense, is that you? you know, that was built in California, but the lunar module that was attached that was supposed to land on the moon was built on Long Island. And the Apollo uh, whole spacecraft was built by like 50 different manufacturing plants designed by 20 different firms all throughout the country and some group's job it was was to coordinate all this uh, and that's what I sort of did in my job at the Big Dig working for the central group coordinating it. The Big Dig had 38 separate design contracts and 119 separate construction contracts. Uh, in this map, um, I'm all but that's what actually lists all the little packages. You know, this little road, this is one road, but that section is going to be designed by a different company than this company, than this company. Because if you had just one company do it, it would take them 30 years to do by themselves. And so you have to fast track it if you want to get it done, you know, in a relatively short period of time. So uh, uh, it rivals the most complicated technology. Uh, endeavor that the United States ever tried to do. In the interest of time, I'm just going to take you through two pieces of the Big Dig, but there are literally hundreds of them that one could. The first one I want to talk about is uh, South Station, if you know where that is. In Boston, is right here. Here's the railroad <coughs> tracks. It's hard to see, but you'll see them in a, a little bit better, but where I'm pointing are all the feeder lines for the railroad tracks. There's some railroad tracks right there that come into South Station. Uh, and then here's some highway ramps. I-90, the Vance Pike, starts in Seattle, got built all the way across the United States, and this is where it dead-ended. So I-90 comes in and curves, and dead-ended at 90, 
I-93. And, and as I said, one of the two things about the Big Dig was to extend I-90 through um, the South Boston Waterfront and cross Boston Harbor and go directly to Logan Airport. And this color here, green, is showing what the alignment will be of that new I-90 as it gets built through, you know, literally an existing city. Right? This, we're not out in, in rural farmland. And I just wanted to show you some of the complexity of what it took to do this. Um, and that complexity I'm going to just show you is this blue section here. Because you have a highway you want to build, but you have railroad tracks that feed, you know, 75,000 people a day uh, coming into Boston to South Station. You can't, well you could, I guess, shut the trains down, but that would not be a very human ecological thing to do. Um, and it would force all those people onto cars and the highway's already jammed and, you know, people do need to work and survive and pay tuition to send their kids to college and other things. So, you know, how do you do that? Um, well, one thing you could do is you could just build it up in the air, right? Because that always, for a hundred years, would always turn out to be a nice, easy way to do it. But the big dig wasn't about that. We didn't want to build uh, elevated stuff. So the big dig was going to put this, this is the eastbound section right here. This is the westbound coming from Logan towards the Mass Pike. We're going to build those underground and put them under these train tracks, but we couldn't touch the train tracks. And trains are very, very uh, specific. Yeah. You know, you could, uh, if you want to detour these ramps here, we detoured them all over the place. Cars can turn pretty quickly, they can go up and down. Trains can't turn quickly, they can't go up and down very easily. And so what I'm now about to show you is what the big day came up with. Um, uh, 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 so here's some soil and here's some train tracks above the soil. And uh, I-90 is over here, but it dead ends. And we want to build this box in this color orange or whatever you call that. And we want to take this box and we want to literally push it underneath the train tracks because we can't close down the train tracks. We can't, we can't build from the top down. So we decide, well, let's just build from the side going across. Um, had never been done before in the United States. Uh, a little piece of this had been done uh, in a European country, but nothing at this scale. So here's the train tracks, and there's lots of train tracks. And this is a commuter rail, but every New York uh, bound Amtrak train goes on these train tracks, and we want to build a tunnel under these train tracks. Now, if there was solid rock under those train tracks, relatively easy. You could just chisel your way through the rock. The rock would be stable enough to hold up the train tracks. But no, uh, we're right by Boston Harbor. The land under these train tracks is sort of half wet most of the time. It's like mud, muck. Uh, if we start taking the dirt out from under these train tracks, the land would, uh, would uh, sink. Thank you. Feel free to help me out as we go along. Uh, and if these train tracks depressed like an inch and a half, they would be out of tolerance uh, and the trains would all have to stop. Um, and of all the trouble the Big Dig got into in its 20 years of life, um, imagine if we stopped all the trains coming into Boston. So um, we decide, uh, here's those train tracks, we decide, well, we're going to tunnel, we're going we to create these concrete boxes, which I showed you before, and we're going to push them under the train tracks. So we had two places we needed to do that. Here's I-90 again coming and dead ending into downtown. And the whole idea is to take I-90 and put part of it in this box here under the train tracks and then take I-90 coming the other way and put part of it in and connect it back over this way. So here's the beginning of building those boxes. If you notice, we're building the boxes right up to the edge of the train tracks, but no closer. Uh, and then here in those boxes, we've actually built a concrete can you kind of see the concrete tunnel here? It's kind of dark in here. And you see these pipes right here? Um, you ever have a flat tire and you take your, you know, what's the, the jack? And you turn the jack and it kind of, it's amazing how with a little bit of force you can lift up your own car. Uh, well, that's a manual jack. jack. When you go to the gas station and they lift it up on the thing, that's a hydraulic jack. Uh, so. 
um, you know, and I, I'm I'm some human ecologist guy who you know stared out this window for you know four years, and I'm working with these people, and they come up with this idea: we're going to build this box, and we're going to put these pipes that are hooked up to these hydraulic jacks, and we're just going to jack this box underneath the train tracks. Um, and I'm like, okay, you know, my job was to my job title was to minimize, my I was traffic manager at the big day. My job was to make sure whatever we did, we protected the quality of life of people who drove, walked, bicycled, or took transit into Boston. My job was to try to keep the city alive while all my colleagues who knew about all this stuff, uh, you know, uh, had their day in the sun. So here's these jacks and here's this box we're going to go underneath the train track. But what would happen if you just you know, first of all, to push the box into the soil, you have to take the soil out. Well, the soil's all mucky, right? So if we start taking the soil out, the train tracks are probably gonna, um, what was that word? Uh, sink. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and that would be good. So some experts from Europe come in, and you know how ice skating rinks get their ice? They pump freezing, uh, whatever it is, some liquid uh, freon or something, uh, in pipes underneath and it freezes. So you see all these things here that look like they're ice? We drill these pipes down in the ground, 20 feet deep, and look how many there were. If you actually count them up, they're like every 10 feet. Um, hundreds of them, all hooked up to these other pipes. And we have this gigantic refrigeration plant and the idea is, well, let's freeze the soil. And then we come up, and the soil is not now muck, it's frozen, which is great because we can then push our box up to it and have guys, you know, chiseling away at the frozen soil and then push the box some more and then chip away some more of the frozen soil. But the great thing is, the train tracks won't sink. And that's, after all, what matters most. It does not matter what, what does not matter most is how much does it cost. We could argue about, and I want you to ask me questions about that when I'm done, but our approach was what matters most is we got to keep the trains working without failing. Um, so um, here's all those train tracks, here's those boxes, and this is the receiving side. And look at all what looks like snow. It's all frozen ground. And here's like a side view of it. And do you know what spray foam insulation looks like when you want to put it in the wall of your house? We spray foam on the sides of this thing because, you know, um, uh, you know, because it gets hot in the summer. And of course, we couldn't just do this during the winter because that would have been too smart. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, this whole ground is frozen, and we got these boxes over here, and we want to push them underneath. Here's a close up of that yellow. So, now it's summer, and we've got to put insulation pads millered on top of it. You know, and here's, here's the receiving end for those boxes made uh, framed in steel, but the boxes haven't yet come. And here's the ground that's frozen, and here's those pipes that are freezing the ground. And this was called the uh, ground soil freezing method for building the I-90 extension. By the way, just under a half a mile. We had uh, uh, five miles of I-90 to build to get to Logan. This is just the first half mile um, uh, <coughs> trying to help give you complexity. But now imagine you're inside that concrete box and you're this guy running this machine, and it wasn't just guys, we had a lot of women on the force, and, and you got this thing, and there's this big um, saw blade, and here's the frozen ground. It actually looks almost white right there, and he's at the front end of the box, and he's like chiseling away at this, and then it falls down to the floor, you can look here, and then we had ways, which I don't remember, of pulling it out, and when he chiseled enough of it away, um, then there was room to actually push the box forward with these hydraulic rams that, that you know, are quite amazing. And um, I went and um, one of the fun things of preparing for you today is I got back in touch with a whole bunch of old friends from the Big Dig and 
uh, and, and, and was able to find some wonderful material. Uh, and uh, one of my best buddies who was in charge of public affairs for the Big Dig, uh, who now lives in Dublin, in charge of public affairs for the Dublin Highway Authority, uh, sent me this video. Uh, and um, uh, so here's that concrete box, right? And we want to push it this way. And this is fast forward. Now here's this red line. That's where the box started. Now the hydraulic rams you can't see, but they're under here and they're pushing this way. And if you look real closely, that edge of the concrete box is going to get further to the left of this red line. And it moved 32 inches uh, a day of a whole bunch of guys and a whole bunch of technology. And by the way, that, the hydraulic ram is causing that little smoke. And if you notice, see the box is now, you know, like six inches or whatever. And by the time this video is done, the edge of that box will have been pushed like a foot away from that red line. And they did this 24 hours a day for about 14 months, keeping the ground frozen, guys chiseling up at the front. The trains never stopped. And then finally, that saw blade comes through on the other end. And this was the photo taken of the guys on that work crew and that shift. Uh, you know, it's like, it's like building the rail across America and meeting somewhere in Nebraska. Uh, uh, and, and then, uh, and then um, uh, you know, I-90 got pushed further, um, you know, uh, a half a mile under the train tracks. Now the people who rode those trains every day could look out the window, because the train moves very slow as it pulls into the South Station. You could see all the white. And, they had no idea what was going on underneath. Um, uh, but, you know, all the workers and, and folks like me did. Um, and then, you know, you know, cities are built up over hundreds of years. There's pipes, there's stuff, there's, uh, you know, the old sewer pipes were made of wood and then they were made of cast iron and then they were made of pottery and, and there were utility lines. and. And whether you're building that section of tunnel or the next section of tunnel I'm about to show you, you really don't know what's down there, despite everything you do. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not here to defend the big dig. I'm not here to tell you it's a good idea that a $3 billion original cost ended up going to $17 billion. But, um, um, but you know, when you go through and you destroy a city and build an elevated highway, and then you come back 30 years later and you say, well, you know, let's, let's make it, let's fix that mistake. Let's, let's get rid of the elevated and put it underground. Um, you run into all kinds of devils underground that, uh, that you have to solve. And, and no matter what you do professionally, I guarantee you, you'll always find things that you didn't think. You, you're going to find uh, unforeseen problems uh, that you have to solve. And sometimes they, make, uh, they cost you time and schedule, and sometimes they cost you money. Uh, but most of the time, you can solve them. Uh, and this was my segue into talking about the other tunnel we built, the big tunnel. Uh, back to our famous red line or the black line that we were talking about before. Uh, we've got to put this thing on the ground. Uh, so how do you do that? Uh, how about we close the six-lane elevated highway uh, uh, for four years, uh, just shut it down, and then take it down, and then we'll have all the space we need, and we'll build a tunnel underneath. What do you think? Great idea. Um, have you guys heard of environmental impact statements and reports and stuff? Could you imagine writing that? Um, uh, you know, by the way, the air pollution that would get caused by the gridlock alone would kill you. The business people would kill you. The residents would kill you. I mean, air, so it wasn't really a good option. So here's what we came up with. Here's the elevated highway. It's held up by these green pieces of steel. Remember those, the, 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 the uh, structure we kept seeing, whether it was in New York on the West Side Highway or what I showed you in the early 40s. Um, and what we decided was, well, we need to build a tunnel underneath, and that tunnel's going to need walls. 
So let's build the walls first from the surface and then use those walls with temporary pieces of steel that we'll use to hold up the old artery. And these pieces of steel holding up the old artery, by the way, went down into, you know, way down into bedrock. But because we're going to hold them up temporarily with these pieces of steel that are attached to these new tunnel walls, we get them to get to cut off the old steel on the ground, and that frees up the space, and we'll tunnel, and we'll build the highway. Um, simple. And, and then we got, oh, by the way, we've got buildings. <laughs> you know, you've got buildings on either side, you know, and you know, you're in very tight, confined spaces, and you have tight height restrictions. Here I just said to you, we're going to build these walls, well, some of the walls were outboard or outside of the elevated highway, but some of those walls were right underneath the elevated highway. And, you know, uh, how do you do that? Well, we designed and had built in Europe these pieces of equipment that had big gears on them that could chisel down and, and start to create the space. It's the equivalent of a shovel going into the ground to build those walls. And the height of this thing was exactly the height you needed to fit underneath the height of the old elevated central artery. Uh, and there's that same machine with the big circle. And, and it, would, it, would, it would go down and chisel. And then we would put this liquid called slurry into where we took out um, the soil. Because the slurry, and this comes from Germany, uh, was a liquid, but it was thick enough that it would prevent the earth from collapsing in to the hole that you just dug. Because, you know, like you go to the beach, you dig a hole, and it all just collapses in. Well, we couldn't have that happen 50 feet, 75 feet below ground, so we had this slurry wall. So we call these slurry walls. And here's that machine. Here's the old elevator artery that's dark up here with a little bit of light in between the two sections of artery. And here's that low headroom machine, and here's this trench and we're building and digging and building slurry walls and into those slurry walls we would then take gigantic pieces of steel because when you build something out of concrete you want to also put rebar or steel into it uh, and these were gigantic I-beams you know like five feet by six feet by 100 feet long and we would drop them down into the liquid slurry uh, and then we would pour concrete between them and the slurry would come back up to the surface and we would recycle the slurry and this would go on for years and years to downtown Boston. Um, and here's those pieces of steel sticking up just a little bit above the ground. Still got the elevated artery, but now we got a wall that goes down 100 feet and it's got all these pieces of steel and we didn't disrupt um, the old buildings and disrupt the old artery. And now here, those pieces of steel have been brought up with some extra concrete and here's those frames I showed you in that early caricature. Uh, and then here's the old pieces of steel holding up the artery. You see this one right here? It used to go down 100 feet, but it's been cut off. The, in, the, in the load of it's been transferred to this new steel, which is in the load of that's been transferred onto the, two, onto the new walls that will become part of the future tunnel. And here's another view. Uh, the brown is the new steel. Um, Boston Gardens right on the other side here. And these things are, uh, are sitting on the new tunnel wall that's underground that no one yet really knows is there. And the old artery is still in place. And so what I just showed you here in caricature, this steel holding up the artery has been transferred to these gizmos here, wait here, and now we can go below in between the walls and start to dig out. And here's one of the first pieces of the first months of digging out. And here's that first level of steel. The ground is right here. We're going to go down, you know, between 50 and 150 feet. We're only down like 15 feet here using very small pieces of equipment. We really don't want to knock that steel out of the way. Uh, and this is what, it, um, you know, taking, taking out with teaspoons for the first couple months of digging this tunnel. But boy, a couple months go by, you're down a little, low, uh, uh, a little deeper. Now you're starting to look up. If you look up through here, here's those pieces of steel, and there's that old elevated central artery. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Up through here. And we're starting to get the beginnings of the tunnel. And I'm just some human ecologist. I get to walk through this, and I'm just like, this is, you know, this is cool stuff. You know? <laughs> you know? Uh, you know, I used to help Miller do some stuff around campus. This is 
this, this is. <laughs> yeah, heading, heading off, you know, the, heading off and up, uh, that work is unbelievable. Yeah, it really is. It's yeah, just unbelievable. Really, yeah. Um, never had been done anywhere. Yeah, I, believe it. <laughs> I, I, will, um, uh, I will tell you. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself, so let's continue. So now, imagine you've dug down even more. Now, here's those walls that I showed you. We built from the surface. You can kind of now really see them; they're exposed. But as you dig down, that steel that was just at the top is not enough to hold those walls from collapsing. Because you got all these skyscrapers, you got all this soil, and it's putting pressure on these walls to collapse in. So every like 20 feet you dig down, you got to put these gigantic pieces of steel across from wall to wall to act as braces um, to just keep the walls from falling in. Uh, and uh, and then you sort of this was a shallow section of the tunnel, so you sort of get down to the bottom. Um, and these are multiple layers of steel holding the walls apart, going up like in scale, probably up to up where I'm drawing on the wall. But you're now down at the bottom, and um, and you and, and and you want to build the floor of the tunnel. And by the way, you know there's the uh, you're uh, you're uh, 100 feet from the edge of Boston Harbor. The water table, like if you dug down, is like eight feet below grade. So if you just put a floor in. The water pressure would just take that concrete floor and just make it float up. So you got to go and you got to make a floor and you got to make it really thick and you got to make it really heavy. And so here's an example of like a gazillion pounds of rebar going down 15 feet. I don't have a shot of it because um, you're going to build the heaviest floor you could possibly imagine. And we're going to put kind of conduits and ventilation and other things we need for the tunnel in it. But the main function of it is to act as a weight that was so heavy that the pressure of the outside world wouldn't get to it. And so now that concrete floor has been poured. We got walls. We got a roof. You know, wow. You know, you could walk from one end to the other, uh, and it kind of almost looks like you know um, people be driving through it. It was still five years after I took this that uh, this tunnel opened. There was still that much work to do. Uh, but now it's getting close. We've got tiles on the wall. We've got a ceiling in. Um, was it a perfect ceiling, which I'd be happy to talk about after questions. But, uh, you know, it's sort of like, okay, you know, we sort of get this, this thing going. Um, I forget what year this was. I tried to find a photo with faces. But we did a College of the Atlantic Alumni Association tour of the construction of the Big Dig. And here was the photo I took of the group. And we're literally walking from South Station to North Station in downtown Boston underground in this tunnel. Everyone thought it was the coolest thing. Um, uh, and uh, that's all I'll say about that. Um, uh, you know the, does the, the Zakem Bridge, does anyone know? The Cable State Bridge across the harbor? I happen to think it's a beautiful bridge. Um, it was designed on the back of an envelope by this Swedish engineer called Christian Men um, because the Big Dig had a different design for a bridge that was sort of a more ugly, less costly bridge. The city of Cambridge said, we'll sue you if you build that bridge. <laughs> I'm not making any of this up. During that 19, 1983 to 1991 time period I mentioned, this was all the case. So uh, the bridge is done, but the tunnel is not done. It turned out to be quicker to build the bridge out over the river than it was to build the tunnel. So we decide to open up the bridge to the public. And a quarter of a million people showed up on a Saturday and walked across the bridge. Um, uh, and I like taking photos. So um, and, 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 and there I am with this guy. And, and, and the bridge is empty. And I think, what a thrill to be able to have a job where you, you, know, you can experience things like that. Um, uh, one of the things I learned on the job, and Millet, I'm sure, would remind us all, that safety is first, so you should never be in a construction site without wearing a hard hat. So uh, in case Miller came today, I put this slide in to show that most of the time I always did wear my hard hat. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't have a good photo of it, but for those of us who are Bruce Springsteen fans, uh, this was the day the Zinken Bridge was, uh, was dedicated. Uh, Bruce Springsteen sung at the dedication because it was named after this uh, civil rights leader, Lenny Zakem, who was a big Bruce Springsteen fan. 
in, um, uh, uh, you couldn't squeeze any more people uh, onto that bridge. In fact, the civil engineers freaked out that the bridge couldn't handle the weight of the people because the bridge was designed for cars that are moving and not all sitting in one spot. So that turned out to be a crisis. They tell them not to tap their feet. <laughs> you did only play acoustic. I wonder if I had to do it. Um, but that was just a blast, and I love taking photos of the Zaken Bridge, so uh, I couldn't help myself. And so now we got, you know, we, you know, the bridge is done, but the tunnel's not done. But, you know, we built those walls I showed you, and we transferred the load of the elevated artery onto these green pieces of steel, and then we started to dig out underneath, and then we got down to build the floor. And, um, and you know, so like the tunnel's like ready. Um, uh, and so I think it's about 2003. And, um, uh, and we get to the weekend where we're about to open the tunnel for the first time. And at this point, my job, uh, I apologize. So I told you what my job was earlier. Um, my second main job in the big dig was, you know all these highway signs that you see when you go through highways? Well, it turned out that signing the highway for the big dig was really complicated. Uh, ramps were you know, very difficult to, you know, when you drive on I-95 to Bangor, you know, the exits, you, you can put the signs a mile and a half in advance and then a mile and a half a mile. And there's no height restriction like there wasn't here, so the signs are 20 feet tall with 18 inch high letters. But you can't do that in a tunnel uh, where you only had three feet of room for the signs. And um, uh, we had uh, hired uh, an engineering firm to design all the signs. There were 642 signs for the big dig. Um, and um, they got peer reviewed, to use a technical term. And the, and the peer review failed the signage plan. Uh, and my boss asked me to lead up a group of two other people. And I, for three days a week, I sat in my office with this team. And we, we designed every sign that the big dig uh, uh, when you drive. Now, did I take a class at College of the Atlantic on highway sign design? I don't think I did. But, <laughs> but, um, but this is what a human ecologist can do. You know, the, your boss is looking for someone to integrate things, and you know you, there were a gazillion things to integrate about these signs, and they asked me to do this, and, and I'm pretty proud of the work we did. But but I digress. My third job was well, when we build the new highway, but we got little pieces of there's always like how do you take people off the old highway and put them on the new highway, and well, you know, if you build 99 percent of the new highway without disrupting the old, how do you build that last 1% when, which means you got to stop the old for a little bit. And here was an example. Uh, so here's going to be the new entrance. It's, it's an elevated highway that they did build just before downtown Boston South Station's right here. And this is the way you're going to go to get into that new tunnel to go under downtown Boston to go up over to the Charles River. And uh, on a Friday night, this was taken early Saturday morning, we shut off um, the whole old highway down to one lane, and it's normally three lanes. Uh, and we had lots of months of publicity in advance, and I'll show you in a second why we did this. And the reason we did this is because, oops, I digress, uh, 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 those signs I all did, this was the team, the three of us, that's me on the left that uh, designed the signs. Um, uh, here's an example of some of the signs we put up on that last weekend before we opened up uh, the highway system. Uh, you wouldn't have, you know, what number is the exit which gets the A, B, and C? I, I can't begin to tell you how complicated it all is. Um, uh, uh, but we decided to put little plaques on the back of some of the signs to, uh, to, to say we always, you know, could always look up at it. And so here's one of the plaques. Uh, you know, uh, um, we did use public money for this, so please don't uh, get me in trouble. I don't know why I wanted to really show you this, but that last weekend where we have everyone squeeze into one lane, and you'll always see them queued up very close together because there was a lot of traffic that last weekend. Um, but it's sort of like, um, you know, most things you do with your career, you don't do by yourself, you do with the team. 
And, you know, for the most part of the Big Dig, we literally had a team of uh, uh, 200 management people like I was with a team of 5,000 construction and designers. And here was that last weekend, and everybody was just smiling. You know, it was just such an amazing thing. Uh, I, I feel so lucky. The Big Dig has got all kinds of pluses and minuses. I, I, I know that, but it's still something that is just so proud to be with. But the reason we closed that lane down to one lane is, is imagine where I'm pointing is where people want to drive to go north onto the Zakem Bridge. But wait, 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 what's this? Well, there's some big pieces of steel holding up the old central artery right here. But we couldn't take this piece of steel down until we took traffic off this old central artery. But we couldn't do that, you know, <laughs> until the last minute or we'd get in big trouble. So here we are. Uh, uh, I showed you that one lane on Saturday morning, but this was that Friday night. They're busily cutting, uh, you know, uh, what's it, acetylene torching? You know, you know, taking away the steel, gigantic pieces of steel uh, to get it out of the way. Uh, you know, I took this photo, you know, I'm out there, it's midnight, these guys are just working non-stop because we, this was like Friday night, but we got to finish this thing by Monday morning and have the new highway open or all hell will break loose uh, in Boston. Um, uh, and we did. And, and, and so we actually got it open on Sunday instead of Monday morning. So here's traffic taking the first vehicles going in that new tunnel. South Station's right over here, the bus, the bus station, South Station is right here. And there's the little lights of the tunnel. There's the first vehicles going in the new tunnel. I'm actually in the operations center. This was before um, NSA and surveillance issues. Um, we have all kinds of cameras watching traffic. Um, and then here's an actual photo in the, uh, from the surveillance camera at the operations center. Here's the first vehicles. They're actually um, um, uh, got their brake lights on, not because there's traffic congestion, but because everyone is staring at the walls and the <laughs> tunnel. Uh, it's the first time anyone had been in it. It was, you know, quite amazing. Uh, and 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 it was sort of surreal because, like, the next week, um, next couple weeks, I should say, here's the old elevated heart artery. Underneath this, there's now a wider highway. Instead of six lanes on the old elevated, there's now eight to ten underground on the new one. Supplemented by the new extension of I-90 over to Logan, so the eight to ten don't even need to carry the same traffic that used to use the old six, because a lot of the eight uh, of that six is now in the new I-90 going to Logan. And it's sort of bizarre, because you have this old elevated highway, and it's like empty. Uh, and we're already starting to demolish it because, after all, that's what this was all about. And you know, the crews are out there. You know, you know, the, we're not even two days into using the new tunnel, and we're furiously um, out, you know, demolishing the old highway and then taking pieces down and carting them away. Uh, uh, they were literally taken to China and recycled, and they came back as automobiles and, and other stuff. Uh, in fact, when you, the, the value of the steel of the old artery was so uh, worthy that the contractor we hired to demolish it, we didn't even have to pay them. They paid us because the value of them selling that steel on the used market was, was so intense. So here's different photos of, you know, uh, the artery being demolished and, and, you know, cars are still, you know, meandering around on streets that were open. Um, uh, if you, any of you know Rose Wharf in Boston with the famous arch, um, uh, here's, you know, we're starting to get down there. and It's kind of like, remember those old photos I showed you of them building it where you saw the, the frame and not the deck? It's sort of, we're now kind of going back 50 years to those old framed photos. Remember that building I told you about with the with the points with the cone on it. Um, uh, this building right here, and you see the frame right there, 54, 2004, 50 years later, we're back at the same spot where there's just the frame. Uh, 110 million back in 54, 
uh, 17 billion uh, 50 years later. But the point is, uh, you know, you get there and you start demolishing it, and 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 so you know, yes, the big dig was about relieving relieving the traffic congestion from that funnel of those 38 lanes all coming into one spot. A funnel which was a really bad thing from a traffic point of view, which, by the way, when there's a lot of traffic, there's a lot of air pollution, a lot of bad fuel mileage, a lot of bad things for the environment as well. But, you know, we're all responsible for that because we all stopped those highways from getting built that would have, you know, not caused that funnel. But the big dig was not, you know, supposed to be just about for cars, it was now supposed to be about people. And people at ground level, you know, we don't want to look at elevated highways. So there's that same grain exchange building with the pointy roof that I was showing you before. And the idea was, you know, you get rid of the artery and you get to build this stuff. And, and you know, wouldn't that be amazing in the heart of a city? Um, and here's that, you know, arch at Rose Wharf again I showed you. Well, Here's an artist's conception. Actually, this is an actual photo that was doctored up a little. The arch of Rose Wharf, there's the rotunda. The arch is, there's those white looking towards the harbor. The arch is actually right here, but from where you would stand on a pedestrian over here, you know, you couldn't see it. And the idea was, you know, boy, get rid of that artery, build some parks and open space, and, 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 and look at what you could do in the downtown. And, you know, um, talk about the ecology of a city, how you could change change that. But and and you know, imagine if you did this not just in Boston, but in every city in the country that that had this kind of elevated highway built through it. Um, and so, you know, what was an elevated uh, um, eyesore uh, scar, if you will, you know, could become this in all these wonderful open spaces. And, and this is what we were all expecting in Boston. And uh, I added it up. It took 23 years to do, to go from that on the left to that on the right. The, the parks here is formerly known as the Rose Kennedy Greenway, named after Senator Ted Kennedy's mom. And have um, uh, and, and any of you been in any of the Greenway or the parks or, or, or whatnot? But, um, you know, the, you know, we spent so long building the big dig, the demo happened pretty quick, the parks got uh, built, and, and in the last section here, I, I wanted to kind of have, if we can, an open conversation among us all, which is, uh, you know, um, what do we think of these parks? I took this photo four days ago. There's the arch at Rose Wharf. Now granted, it's the middle of winter and it's cold, um, and you're just looking at one piece of the Rose Kennedy Greenway, but, but look at this flat wall of all these different buildings. Now, there used to be an elevated highway here, so the flat wall kind of makes sense, but does that flat wall make sense now that there's no highway? Is that what Jane Jacobs would have said we should do? Looking in the opposite direction, I'm in the Harbor Towers parking garage, looking up, here's Faneuil Hall, up over here. Um, look like a lot of life to you, you know? <laughs> um, just for the record, just two blocks away, uh, I took this photo just randomly. There was lots of life on the sidewalk. It's freezing, there's people. Um, but not much on the Greenway on the same day. Um, I wanted to uh, share with you a little bit of why that happened um, uh, and then talk to you in some more about some ideas about Jane Jacobs. So, um, uh, I love environmentalists, I love the law, I'm a lawyer, I'm an environmentalist, um, but um, but, but, but how could it happen that we end up with such grand open parks with no built, there's no cafe. I mean, I, mean, I don't know about you guys, but you know, I mean, I, 
you know, I work for myself part time. I, I go, I go sit in a cafe for three hours and use the Wi-Fi and do all that. There's none of that in any of the Rose Kennedy Greenway. And why is that? Well, part of the answer is because of us environmentalists. That ten years of permitting I talked about. See this box over here? Each of these boxes, I should have measured it. I remember them. It's, it's probably 15 inches high by 11 inches wide and about 18 inches deep. They held one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight documents that were each about two, that one's about two and a half inches thick, that's about an inch thick. Those were all the environmental permitting documents we had to do for the first 10 years to get approval to build the big dig. Um, this is what you have to do in today's world um, um, to build anything. Uh, I try to build wind projects and solar projects. You, you kind of have to do the same thing. It's not just highways. And um, then what happens, you, you, you get through that thing, and you get something called the Certificate of the Secretary of Environmental Affairs of the Final Supplemental Environmental Impact Report, Central Artery Third Harbor Tunnel Project, 1990. It's actually published in 1991. And I think you, we put that on the portal for you guys, for any of you who want to look at it. Um, you know, amazing language. I'll just read a couple sentences. The 27 acres created in downtown Boston by the Depression of Central Artery that will reconnect the harbor to its city, the city to its boulevards, and its people to both. It is an urban dream come true. This new land creates an unprecedented opportunity to improve the quality of life in Boston. Well, that all sounded good, but what happened was that the last thing that the environmental advocates wanted was to go through 20 years of construction and end up with the real estate development wealthy interests using that open land to build new buildings and make you know more condos. So they worked with the environmental secretary, and these are his actual quotes from that certificate. 75% of this new open park in downtown Boston, created by getting rid of the elevator artery, has to be open space. And then he went on and repeated it again, because he knew how controversial it was going to be. It was, like, what is it, like a 14-page document? Um, this open space is an essential mitigation measure. Mitigation meaning for the, you know, it's the least we could do for putting everyone through 20 years of construction pain. Any change in the amount of open space would require new permits. That's like saying, forget about it, because no one, <laughs> no, you know, he doesn't use those words, but no one is, uh, is going to want to like reopen that can of worms. Um, and so you end up with, and I know the guy in charge of designing these parks quite well. Uh, they hired the best landscape architects from, you know, RISD and Harvard and every, And they worked, they had hundreds of community meetings, and this is a, a, a one of the parks by the North End. Um, and, and, oh, and by the way, that environmental uh, approval had this quote in it. Uh, and I guess he got what he asked for, right? Um, but what I wanted to do with you all is just kind of go back and remind ourselves a little bit of Jane Jacobs, and you could read for yourself. These are some quotes from chapter two. You remember her discussion about the, the ballet on the sidewalk, and um, uh, and uh, you know, so sort of the stuff that you know she was experiencing walking down Hudson 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 Street, and um, and you know, in her mind, as I read her book, it's like. People do things and gather uh, uh, because there's other stuff bringing them to do it already. They don't just go gather, you know, uh, what's it called, a Burning Man? <laughs> you know, like, that happens, but they do build a city, right? Um, but, you know, we don't normally just gather in the middle of nowhere. We gather because there's, there's restaurants, there's shops, there's reasons, there's museums, there's reasons for us to be in a place to gather. Um, and I think that's what she's trying to say. Um, and then she actually talks about parks. And, 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 uh, and I think she's got some of it right. And, and, and if it's OK, dear professor, I'm going to challenge some of what she writes in her book. Um, you know, 
you know, she talks about the conventional nature, and the big day did the convention. You know, um, uh, you know, it's like a gift from God. We will get rid of this elevated highway and give you these beautiful open spaces. Uh, uh, but, but Jane said, you know, really we should do the opposite. We should, we should, um, uh, uh, you know consider uh, city parks as deprived spaces that need the boon of life and appreciation uh, conferred on them. Now my interpretation of that quote is we need to have stuff, instead of having a big open park we should have little parks surrounded by beautiful little buildings that I think she said maybe should be more than six stories tall and things should be human scale but we should have a built environment surrounding our parks, and then our parks will be really energized mm -hmm. in our cities. Um, now, one of my criticisms of her, and I went back and reread the chapter again to try to make less of a fool of myself in front of you learned uh, students, is, is I don't see anywhere where she actually says exactly how to do that. Mm -hmm. And I don't see any sketches in her book on how to do that. And, you know, you, here's, this is the main big dig park in downtown Boston. The aquarium is right off here to the left. Um, I think this is the last slide. It is. Um, but, you know, we mostly got open spaces. The closest we come to bringing the built environment in is we built one visitor center for um, the Harbor Islands National Park. Uh, it has no services in it. I don't even think it has a toilet. You can go get a pamphlet to know when to get the ferry. Uh, and the other thing we do now, and this is a big innovation, is we bring food trucks in. You know, those have become the, the rage in cities. We allow food trucks to park on the edge of the Greenway and, and serve, you know, lunch and stuff. And, and um, you know, uh, my question for you guys is, you know, uh, what do you think? It, it is, is this what is this what Jane Jacobs um, would have wanted in downtown Boston? Um, do we even know what she would have wanted?